welcome to the final lecture of week 11 and uh, so in this lecture we look at the last component that we need for making our uh, estimation models work right so our uh, state estimation models work which is essentially the measurement model so remember the measurement model tells you what the what is the probability of z given xt right what's the probability of zt given xt and if you are using a map it's given xt comma m right so the measurement model tells you what is the probability of zt given xt comma m right and uh, so what i'm going to do in the next uh, few slides is basically look at one specific kind of sensor and develop a measurement model for that sensor alone right and uh, so we are going to look at what are called range sensors in the following slides right but uh, whatever principles i'm talking about now right so they basically can apply to other kinds of sensors as well right whether it is a camera sensor or a barcode operated landmark detector and so on so forth right so in fact there's a funny story about uh, uh, which one of my uh, students did this uh, when uh, when uh, there was this uh, job to build a robot for a, to move around in office space in a company uh, while people were trying to come up with very complicated algorithms for uh, localizing the robot figuring out which room or which uh, cubicle the robot was on uh, he came up with a very simple solution. He printed uh, unique barcodes for each location and then equipped the robot with a barcode reader. Right? So the robot just moves to a particular cubicle, reads the barcode and figures out exactly which cubicle it is in. It didn't have to worry about all the cubicles looking similar. Right? So sometimes if you get the right engineering solution, problems become easier uh, than trying to come up with something uh, more uh, sophisticated. Yeah. But anyway, so getting back to the main uh, uh, lecture here. Uh, so the uh, the idea here is I'm going to look at a typical uh, uh, sensor. So it could be, for example, an ultrasound sensor, right? So here is an here is an illustration of that. So there's a mobile robot in a corridor, and it basically has a range finder with these uh, multiple ultrasound uh, detectors running off in different directions, right? So typically. Uh, each of these ultrasound detectors is going to uh, uh, return the distance to the the nearest uh, object in the direction of the scan right so you can see that each of these uh, uh, rays here is one direction in which the ultrasound uh, sensor is scanning and most of the cases it is returning to you the distance of the nearest obstacle right in some cases it fails right there is an obstacle here it fails to detect right there are a couple of cases where it fails to detect objects in other cases it basically stops short right so even though there is no object here it basically returns that there's an object. So some kind of failure of these sensors could also happen. But typically, it tries to detect what is the distance to the nearest obstacle in the direction of the scan. And if there is no obstacle, it is supposed to give you back whatever is the maximum value for the sensor range. Right? In that case, you know that in that direction of scan, right, there are no obstacles. Right. So that's basically what the range sensor is going to give you and let us see how you can uh, 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 put together an actual model for uh, this range sensor. Right. Uh, so just like we saw now, right, many sensors generate more than one numeric measurement value. So, so if I look at a range finder as a sensor, it's going to give me the all the ultrasound readings that we saw. Right. So we saw multiple ultrasound readings. Right. So each one of this is going to return back a specific range value. And so when I say that I'm using a single sensor, which is range sensor, it could still correspond to a vector of measurements, right? So we're going to assume that these are Z1 to ZK and at every time T, I'm going to have all of these capital K measurements available to me, right? And so at every time step T, I'm going to make this measurement and I'm going to use Z sub T K, small k, right? For a specific individual measurement. So it could be a specific uh, value. So this could be k equal to 1, this could be k equal to 2, this could be k equal to 3 and so on and so forth. Right? So for specific values, I'll be looking at each one of these measurements. right? And the other thing that we're going to make uh, uh, life easier, right? so we're going to make uh, an assumption that will make life easier is that I'm going to assume that each of these different values that my range finder returns are independent. Right? So probability zt given xt comma m is actually equal to the product over k of each of the individual sensors so probability that zt1 given xt comma m times probability of zt2 given 
x t comma m and so on so forth right so that's basically uh, what i'm going to assume uh, to make my life easier you can see that uh, almost surely this is not true uh, but uh, we're just going to make that assumption uh, so if i if the map had not been given to me right if i didn't have a map right the probability that this being true is even lesser right because because without knowing the map, if I hit an obstacle in a, in a particular range, then it's quite likely that I'll see an obstacle in a slightly displaced, right? If I see an obstacle in the direction theta equal to 5, right, I'm going to likely see something in the direction theta equal to 6, right? But given that I know the map, right? So when I say I know the map, that means I know where the obstacle is exactly, right? Uh, in uh, in uh, such a case, when you know where the obstacle is, right, the, the probability of me getting a uh, 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 reading that the obstacle is there, right? When I'm pointing at five degrees or six degrees, is independent of whether I got the obstacle reading when when I pointed at six degrees, right? So because I know that there is an obstacle at that distance because of the map. If I didn't know, then this this would have been a harder uh, independence to write. Okay, so this 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 gives me a little bit more leeway here. Okay, so what we are going to do is. If you look, if you if you remember that we talked about multiple uh, different kinds of errors that were happening, right? In some cases there was an obstacle where it, it was missed. In other cases there was no obstacle, but it still returned an obstacle, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to break down the kinds of errors, right, into four different quantities, right? So I'm going to say there is a measurement noise, a small measurement noise, right? Basically, this is due to uh, things like, uh, you know, temperature variations, uh, the sensor is getting a little bit heated, or even atmospheric variations and things like that. So that could cause a slight change in the reading, right? So that we call as a small measurement noise, right? And then the second kind of errors are due to unexpected objects. The map says there is no object, but I, there might be an object, and therefore I'm, I'm sensing something which I'm, when I'm expecting to not sense anything, right? And the third kind of error is due to uh, failure to detect an object, right? Could be because the suddenly the refractive index is, is very high or the object is too black and I'm, I'm not able to uh, actually uh, get any reflection out of it. So whatever, you know, quite a, depending on the kind of sensor that you're using, uh, there are uh, many reasons why the sensor might fail to detect an object. So how to accommodate for that? And the finally, the last thing is, despite however clever I am, there is always a chance that something goes wrong and how to accommodate for that, right? So I'm going to say that the model that I have, the probability of zt given xt comma m, is a mixture of all these four uh, sources of error, right? So, so the, the the overall uh, stochasticity in the measurement comes from all these four, and uh, we will look at how to model each of these densities. Right? Before we go on, so just a, a small notation: when I say zt k star, right? Suppose there is an object in the direction that the kth sensor is looking at time t, then z t k star is the true distance of the object. Okay, so z t k is the actual measurement. Okay, z t k is a measurement that is going to be influenced by all of these errors, right? So z t k is a measurement that is influenced by all of these errors, and z t k star is the true value of the distance of the object. Okay, ZTK star is what ZTK is trying to measure, but it is getting corrupted by all these noises. Okay, it's just the notational thing. We'll see how we use it in the next slides. Right. So the first thing we're going to look at is a small measurement noise. Right. So the sensor roughly gets the range to the object. Right. Roughly gets the distance to the nearest object in the direction of the sensor. Right. Uh, but then the sensor could have a limited resolution. Right? So it could basically be rounding off because it doesn't have enough resolution. Uh, there could be things like, like I said earlier, the, the sensor could heat up, right? or there could be some kind of an atmospheric effect uh, that's affecting the signal and so on and so forth. Multiple reasons. right? So what, how, how we model this is as a very narrow Gaussian whose mean is ZTK star. I don't know this, but for the modeling purposes, I'm assuming that ZTK star is the true distance. right? And I have a standard deviation for this Gaussian, which we call a sigma hit. Remember, this has to be a unidimensional Gaussian, right? Because I'm measuring a single variable. This is a distance to the object. So it's a it's like a univariate Gaussian, not a multivariate Gaussian, right? So I'm going to model it like this. So ZTK star is the, the actual uh, distance. And I'm going to model it as a narrow Gaussian. And remember that, uh, so we'll denote this by P hit, right? And remember that this 
measurement value right cannot exceed z max right and it cannot go below zero either like the distance is zero right i mean so it can't go below zero and z max is the maximum value that this sensor can measure so it can't go beyond zero or z max and therefore it is not really a gaussian right because we are going to truncate it so between zero and z max if ztk actually the the value that you are plugging in here if it is between zero and z max then the probability is given by a gaussian which we call ztk uh, so, so where ztk star is the mean and sigma hit is the variance of this gaussian and we add a, a normalization parameter eta so that we compensate for the probability mass that was cut off beyond z max and beyond zero basically we renormalize this by dividing by this uh, the, the the area under zero to z max so that's basically what eta is okay and if it's outside the zero to z max range the probability is zero so it can never happen okay so now we say this is the distribution p hit so this is the noise that comes from small measurement errors if there was no error i would have measured it as zt k star okay the second source of error is due to unexpected objects right so why is this happening so typically we are assuming that maps are static right i am assuming that there are objects at certain positions in the map and i am not updating the map on a very frequent basis right but typical environments which mobile robots are operating could be dynamic i mean there could be other robots moving around there could be people moving around or even things like paper flying around and stuff like that right and these are objects that are not contained in the map right and uh, but can make the range finder give you a very short reading suppose there is an object at this distance right from the robot but there is a paper flying somewhere in between right so when the robot is taking a reading it will hit the paper and it will come back it will not get to the actual distance of the object right so it gives you a much shorter reading than uh, the uh, uh, the actual distance to the object the ztk star right so one way to think about this hmm, okay let me put all these moving objects into the map right uh, or putting put all these moving objects into the state right so the map is there but i can put them into the state and i'll estimate their location as well right but this is very hard right i mean come on a paper flying around all those things it is hard to work so what we'll do is instead of that we'll just treat it as a sensor noise right we'll treat it as sensor noise so what do i mean by that i'll just say occasionally my sensor might give you a wrong information uh, we'll have to account for that as well right so one thing you should note here right uh, when i start treating this as a sensor noise right so remember that i have a, i have a cone right so if there is an object that is passing by very close to the robot it's very likely to be sensed because it's going to block my sensor quite likely right but if it is flying away it's flying farther away from the robot right that this is the cone if it's flying close i i'm very likely to sense it right if there is a moving object that is farther away from me right i might not sense it right depending on the quality of the sensor the resolution and things like that i might actually miss this object uh, and then the most of my uh, sense uh, my uh, ultrasound emission might go past it and actually hit the true obstacle right so what it really sums up is it so the closer the object the moving object is to the robot or is to the sensor the more likely that i will sense that object therefore the likelihood of sensing these kinds of unexpected objects decreases with the range right the closer you are the more likely that i will sense an unexpected object right so what we do to accommodate for that is to treat the whole thing as an exponential distribution right so the closer i am to the robot the closer i am to a distance of zero right that's a higher probability so the farther i am i have a lower probability and notice that beyond ztk star i don't care right because i would have hit the actual obstacle so i don't care if there is a uh, you know uh, unexpected object after the obstacle right i'm not going to see that so only before the obstacle i'm likely to see the unexpected object right uh, so i expect to see an unexpected object before the obstacle right therefore uh, so this should this is this is again uh, uh, incorrect uh, so this will be between 0 uh, ztk less than ztk star okay not z max it should be ztk star and um, so i am going to model this as an exponential distribution with the parameter lambda short right again i have a normalizing factor because after ztk star i set the 
probability to 0, right. So, all this probability mass has to be redistributed before ZTK star and, and we will take care of that, right. So, <clears throat> so this is the second uh, uh, model and what is the third one, right. So, the third one is when I fail to detect the object altogether, right. So, what happens when I fail to detect the object? That means that I have completely missed the object. So, whatever reason, right. So, it could be because the sensor failed, right, it just stuck somewhere. So, my sensor keeps just returning the maximum value, right. Or it could fail because uh, the object was very good at absorbing the light uh, that it was emitting and therefore, it just did not get any bounce back and therefore, it just assumed that there is nothing in that uh, uh, direction and that uh, till the range of the maximum range, the, the thing is free, right. So, at no, no conditions will I actually accept a reading that is greater than the maximum range, right. I, I will not accept a reading greater than Z max because it does not make sense because Z max is the maximum that the sensor could look at, right. And so, what we will do is we will just model it like a short noise, right. So, it is just a point mass at Z max, right. So, point mass is Z max and uh, this is essentially the probability that I completely miss the object uh, at Z T K star, right. So, I will I'll, I'll just basically return the value of Z max. So, now the thing is probability that Z T K uh, uh, is equal to Z max is 1, it is 0 otherwise, right. So, for this, this component of it just assigns some additional mass to Z max, okay. Now, we are coming to the last one which is the random measurement, right. So, it could basically miss the whole thing or it could uh, generate some kind of a phantom reading when they bounce off walls. I mean, so there could be, uh, I could detect something as much being much closer than it is actually is, right. There could be some kind of a cross track, some inf interference with, with other sensors that makes me put it at some, some random uh, uh, location, right. So, I am not going to overthink this. I am just going to say that, hey, look, after all of this careful consideration, there is a chance that I might mess. I could put the object anywhere between 0 to Z max, right. I could put the object anywhere between 0 to Z max. So, I will say the probability is 1 by Z max. This is basically uniform distribution. So, what are the things? We have four different things here, right. So, we had a Gaussian, then we had exponential, we had a short noise, right, like a, like a impulse function and now we have a uniform distribution. So, there are four different probability distributions and the actual probability of Z t given x t comma m is actually a mix of all these four distributions as we will see here, right. So, the four distributions I basically look at it as a mixture, right. There is p hit, p short, p max and p rand, right. So, p max is when I actually miss the reading altogether, p short is when I hit an unexpected obstacle, p rand is I make a random error and p hit is when I am actually measuring it correctly, but I have a small measurement error. And each of this is weighted by a corresponding Z value here, Z hit, Z short, Z max and Z rand, right. And the condition is they are all positive and they sum to 1, right. So, that P is a probability distribution, right. And so, this is for uh, the individual ray Z T K, right, this just the one, one ray K. And I have to do this for all K, right. And so, for the set of readings that I am going to get, since they are all independent, I am going to compute the probability for each measurement, right, each k and then take the product, right. So, the, the final value q that I return is the product of all the probabilities computed from each one of the 1 to k uh, sensors that I have in my range sensor, right. So, that is basically the probability of Z t given X t comma m. So, likewise, we do this kind of computation for uh, various kinds of uh, 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 sensor models and I mean the book talks about a couple more and if you want to get other flavors, you can read the book, right. So, if you just look at the book, but as far as I am concerned, I will be happy if you understand uh, the range finder measurement model thoroughly and because others are all uh, uh, simple uh, expansions of this, okay. Thanks.